Hello and welcome. You are listening to an informed take on current events brought to you by law students and staff of Queen's University Belfast. This is LawPod. My name is, is Professor Kieran McAvoy. I work here in the law school at Queen's and in the Mitchell Institute. Um, I'm delighted to welcome my guest today, Mark Drumble. Mark is a law professor at Washington and Lee University in the States, and he's a visiting professor here in the law school. Um, he's one of the best known and um, widely respected authors writing critically about international law and transitional justice. Amongst his many publications are two highly acclaimed books on punishment and atrocity in international law, one, a book that was very, very influential for me, um, and another on child soldiers. And his next big book, um, which he's working on currently, is on collaborators and informers in the former communist Czech. Slovakia. Mark, you're very welcome to Queen's Law Pod. So my first two questions just to kick us off are, number one, why communist Czechoslovakia and why informers? Well, good morning, Kieran and all listening. It's a great joy to be here in Belfast and to um, have the opportunity to do a visit in this absolutely intriguing city and a very, very warm university environment, uh, notwithstanding some of the coldnesses that uh, the current pandemic may, may bring to us. Kieran, in response to your question, why, um, let me start with the second part, namely why informers? Why am I intrigued by informers? For a very long time, I've written about a cast of characters that I think are indispensable to the metastasis and normalization of massive human rights abuses and violence. And although the key head top perp perpetrators and leaders may create the spark, uh, the kindling tends to be yielded and offered by ordinary people, ordinary citizens. Many of these ordinary citizens and ordinary people um, inhabit what I would call penumbral or liminal spaces. Um, they don't have a lot of room for agency, for authority, or for movement, but they have some. And without the participation of large numbers of ordinary people, atrocity would never truly become massive. So I'm very interested in these, these liminal characters. And in the past, this is why, as you suggested in the introduction, I've written on child soldiers. I've written a lot about how low-level perpetrators ought to be uh, thought of, processed, punished, or not. I've thought a lot about victims who victimize others in times of atrocity, which is actually one of the trickiest and touchiest subjects. So all this to say that is I see the informer, I see the collaborator as another character in this cast of liminal ordinary people without whom authoritarianism, human rights abuses, and atrocity never could metastasize, never could spread in the way that it does. And then sort of riffing off of that, back to the first part of your question, why communist Czechoslovakia? And here, I think, the answer to the question is probably one of serendipity, because one could think of informers in many different spaces and places and, and talk about them and write about them. But for me, this is a particularly um, appealing place in which to do it, largely because I have a co-author on the book, who is a law professor, Barbora Hola, in Amsterdam, but is a Czech national, grew up in um, Czech Republic, and of course as, as, as a young person in communist Czechoslovakia. And she's been wanting to write for a long time about informers and archives and transitional justice in this context of her own place. So about two years ago, we decided that this was a topic of interest to us. We had an opportunity to write a book chapter on it for a broader collaboration on collaboration. And as we were embarking on that particular chapter, we decided, uh, hey, let's do a book. So I think the answer to your question is the genealogy of the interest in it is partly 
long-standing intellectual curiosity, and then just the randomness sometimes of life where you have an opportunity to do a collaborative project on collaboration and it gels. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I think we would both agree that there are certainly gaps in the knowledge in the transitional justice field around informers and collaboration. It's not a particularly well-studied area in what is you know, still a relatively new field. How would, you, how would you say the issue of informers has been characterised to date in the transitional justice field? Across okay. truth commissions, you know, all the different bits of the transitional justice toolkit. So we have truth commissions, we have prosecutions, we have oral history projects. We have a lot of ways of dealing with the past. How, is, how are informers and collaborators framed within that literature? So I think that's an excellent question because it's actually one of the assumptions that we seek to challenge in the book, certainly in the context of communist Czechoslovakia. In the authoritarian period in Czechoslovakia, the STB, the secret police in Czechoslovakia, uh, accumulated reams of information from informers. And in the files, in the archives, which we're looking through, almost all of the informers who inform are identified as doing so because of fulfilling a patriotic devotional duty of citizenship to the state. Now, when you read the files, you will see very evidently that the vast majority of the content of the information that is provided from the informers has actually very little to do with unpatriotic activities by the people upon whom they're informing, and we can talk about that a little bit later. Now, in Czechoslovakia, following the 1989 Velvet Revolution, transitional justice did seize the character of the informer as a person about whom transitional justice ought to speak. Yet transitional justice did exactly the same binary reductionism in a sense of taking the informer and casting the motivations of the informer to inform as devotional, allegiant, uh, ideological. So I think the answer to your question would be transitional justice constructs informing, at least in the Czechoslovakian context, as motivated by patriotism and duties to the state. Our research finds that that may be a motivation on the part of some, but actually is a very thin motivation. So to me, uh, when transitional justice approaches the informer, at least in the Czechoslovakian context. And I'd be curious to hear from you about, for example, the context in, in Ireland. Um, I think it constructs the informer as sitting on a unicycle, right? So there's one seat and one wheel, and, and that's the seat and the wheel of ideology as the motivation. But through our work, I think we're finding that the motivations behind why people speak to the secret police actually take on a multiplicity of emotions. So it can be constructed much more like a motorcycle as having two wheels or a car as having four wheels. We haven't found an informer that is like a big 18-wheel truck or lorry, right? So we haven't found that. And I think what we'd like to do is cast informing as a motorcycle or a car instead of this one trick pony unicycle of only being motored by ideological devotion because I think that casts everything in excessive simplicity because then transitional justice says, hey, we're the new regime, we're the liberal market democracy, we are the end of history and the way forward is simply to identify the toxic ideology, vaccinate against it, and move on. But in reality, what we're finding is informing is endemic to the human condition. It's part of the soul. So solely, O-L-E-L-Y, not O-U-L-Y, solely casting it as ideologically motivated does us a disservice. And that's what I would say is the problem with transitional justice. That's brilliant. I mean, it sounds to me what you're what you're saying there is you're talking about rehumanizing the informer at some level. I mean, certainly when one looks at the issue here, I've done a little bit of work around this, and I, I supervised a PhD by my friend and colleague Ron Dudai, who who did an excellent PhD as a book forthcoming on this issue on informing. He was focused primarily on the Republican community. 
Um, but what one saw in, in a lot of these instances were actually very human reasons why people um, uh, became informers. Often they were compromised. Often, you know, it, people with gambling debts, people having affairs, and then the intelligence service or the police would find out about that and use that to leverage them in. So the idea that the, they were ideologically or politically motivated to, you know, fight terrorism or something, while sometimes they frame it that way in their own autobiographies, and we have a whole uh, genre of autobiographies here, uh, tout inform, uh, informer uh, biographies and often they'll frame it that way but actually when you look at the detail it's a it's a very human compromising that happens rather than an ideological commitment to counter counter political violence does that resonate for you as well yeah. absolutely the the Czechoslovakian files uh, brim with life and pain and gossip and innuendo and all forms of content, and, and uh, we decided to adopt a lens of trying to understand informing uh, that roots itself in trying to understand the emotions. And among those emotions, yes, allegiance to the state exists, although far less than one would think. What we see in the files are, are a potpourri of emotions. We see ambition, getting ahead, resentment, getting even. We do see fear. Uh, we see simple obedience. Um, we see a variety of motivational factors. And I think unless we come to terms with those, we won't fully understand why people speak to the secret police. And I think it makes it much more difficult for us to undertake the task of distinguishing good informing from bad informing. Because Kieran, the fact remains that no society, no state can exist without people as informants. Policing is not possible. Administrative governance is, is problematic. Whistleblowing would not happen. So I think we need to come to terms with that. And in, in, I know for Barbora, uh, looking through those files is like reading biographies of, of, of people in a different time period. Mm -hmm. So one sits there today and looks at this, and one has one's foot planted in the past while, while reading through them. And then the question is, what can transitional justice do, if anything at all? Should we try to place the informer within this process, or should transitional justice just sit down and not? Can I ask you about the oppositional movements in Czechoslovakia and how they perceived informers? So, for example, again, for, uh, for a quote that comes that came out of Ron Duda's research here. His, his PhD opens with a quote from a former IRA person, quite a senior IRA figure, and the, and, the, and the quote is, I would rather be called a paedophile than an informer. And it's a very strong statement um, which speaks to how reviled um, informers are within Republican political culture. Um, how, how were informers um, viewed by the oppositional movement in Czechoslovakia um, to the communist state? Were they equally reviled? And if so, what is it about, what is it about informers that, that provokes such strong emotion um, amongst uh, uh, resisting communities? So let's answer your question by asking, how do the informers themselves see themselves now 30, 40 years after the facts, right? Because part of our research is not only in the archives. Archives are authored by the police officer who takes the information. So the listener sets the terms of the content. But actually also, um, as a focal point of our research, we're looking at oral histories that are done 30 years after the fact, after the Velvet Revolution, roughly. And informers speak there about how they feel about what they did back then. And sometimes we actually have a file on someone, and then you have you know, this, this person 30, 40 years later talking about it. All of the informers talking about their acts of informing speak about them with shame, with embarrassment, and with atonement. And perhaps they do that because that's reflective of what society expects of them. 
And to me, that's also interesting. If we think of informing as going along to get along to fit in and maximize the space around you, well then, when the regime is such that is responsive to informing, you inform. And when the regime suggests that you should be ashamed of your previous informing, well then you become ashamed of your previous informing. I think the broader reactions in Czech society are fractured. Yes, certainly what we've seen from media accounts, some of them are quite blistering. Um, a number of former informers labeled as informers have sought to rehabilitate themselves by denying that they were informers. And then I think another factor that appears is silence. I think within families, within workplaces, among colleagues, there is a silence that demonstrates itself in people often not wanting to ask older members of their family or their workplace, what did you do in the 70s and 80s, right? So, so and why, why silence? Because one is afraid of shame, because one is scared, is scared of the answer, or because simply that in and of itself is a place of respect that retroactively you can't always look back and judge. The bottom line is it's an awkward space. I think one of the reasons it's awkward is because transitional justice has tried to come into that space with its moralizing weight. And both Barbora and I wonder if the stories of informers were simply told in a humanistic sense that recognizes informing as conversation, informing as social navigation, perhaps after that is presented and a human face is presented to it, perhaps that will trigger more conversations in safe ways, in reassuring ways, and also in probative ways. Mm. Just want to uh, d uh, develop something there. You were uh, pointing towards the kind of the what did you do during the war, daddy or mommy kind of question. And I think as you'll be aware, one of the uh, complexities of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is that um, what ha as the peace process emerged in the 1990s, um, Israel resettled Palestinian collaborators within Israel proper. So um, Palestinian collaborators and informers who'd been working for the Israelis, um, they knew they couldn't leave them behind under the jurisdiction of the Palestinian National Authority. And so they literally shifted, and there's a, whole, there's a whole bureaucratic infrastructure in the Israeli state that looks after collaborators and informers. That's its job. There's a whole subdivision of welfare that looks after them. And so you now have villages, um, Palestinian villages in Israel proper that are made up entirely of former collaborators and they have children so you have children coming along who are all in this village the children of former collaborators it's very interesting sociological phenomena i'm interested if you if you picked up anything in the czechoslovakian context about that intergenerational the children you know the next generation coming along asking that question and, and or is that is that is that even possible in the czech context well i think it's very possible and yeah. and i think if she were here Bar barbora would tell you that every family in the Czech Republic today has that conversational tension lurking under the table and, and, and it exists in every family. And this of course maps onto broader work on intergenerational effects of, of human rights abuse. It's very interesting you raised the Israeli-Palestinian example. A few weeks ago I did a, a virtual workshop on this um, with Shane Darcy at uh, NUI Galway. And one of the listeners there brought up the Israeli-Palestinian example, uh, similarly but differently to how you evoke it. And I think what was very interesting there in her commentary is that there seems to be, certainly from what I remember from her question, in the Israeli-Palestinian context, a sense that um, informing and collaboration by Palestinians was prompted a little bit more through uh, coercion and fear by authorities. And that's interesting because I think it's easier to accept that someone did something because they were scared. The fact remains in Czechoslovakia, certainly once you got into the 70s and 80s, there was rather little coercion on the part of the state. Um, 
most informers came forward through a combination of push and pull. But the push, I think, was fairly tangible on the part of the informer. And as a result, I think that makes those conversations trickier. Um, because if you say that you were scared so you did it, OK, well, the law in all ways, shapes, or form recognizes things like justification and self-defense as, as ways of um, getting one off the hook. But I think it's tougher when you really got stuff from it because you wanted it. And here's another thing that comes out in the files, if I may, may, may go on, and, and something I've been thinking about lately, too. Um, a lot of informers come forward, we find, in the files because it feels good to tell on someone. They're mad at their son-in-law who's cheating on their daughter. They're mad at the person next to them in the office because they're getting more stuff. They're mad because someone has a nicer car, a nicer flat. They're full of resentment. And they come forward, and it feels good. <laughs> what do you do about that? That's very interesting. Um, I want to. I want to uh, just pick up on that and talk a little bit about the ways in which informers map onto big picture historical narratives. Something you, you flagged earlier, and just to give you by way of illustration, in the Northern Ireland context. Um, we have two strange bedfellows meeting in terms of the role that informers have played in, in, in the peace process in particular. And so on the one hand, we have uh, a range of uh, dissident anti-peace process, Republicans in particular, some loyalists as well, but particularly on the Republican side. There are dissidents who, um, if I was doing a piece of research, I was spending probably too much time looking at, at dissident Republican websites. Um, where uh, they accuse former comrades um, in the mainstream Republican movement of having been British agents. And so, you know, um, with very little evidence, and so for example, they, they would allege that Martin McGuinness, um, former IRA leader, um, formerly former De Deputy First Minister, um, Sinn Féin's chief negotiator during the peace process, key player, obviously, in the peace process. So part of their narrative is that uh, Martin McGuinness and other Republican leaders were actually British agents and that it was the British controlling the Sinn Féin drive towards peace and the IRA giving up the armed struggle. So, so, so the, the informer is a central player in that narrative. Very curiously, you also have a similar narrative from uh, retired uh, police officers, former um, intelligence officers and so forth, who, who, some of whom, not all, some of whom will say, we won the war against the IRA because we were running informers. So you have this very strange coalition of, um, of dissident Republicans who, who would obviously loathe the British state and certainly loathe uh, members of security forces and security force members themselves. And so, and in both, the, the, the informer is, the, is, is at the center of the, of the historical narrative. So in Czech history, what, what's the what's the ways in which the informer is dealt? Does the informer get a similarly starring role in the evolution of the big picture history? Well, whether an informer gets a starring role because the informer is seen as hero or because the informer is seen as wretched, in any context, I think, is actually something that we would like to deflate a little bit. M maybe part of our book is aimed towards depoliticizing, de-intensifying the informer. Maybe by saying that informing is really nothing special. It's, it's a bunch of, of, of gossip. It's a bunch of ways to get a free trip abroad. It's a bunch of ways to get some trinkets. It's a bunch of ways to get even. It's a bunch of ways to show some f fidelity to the state. Maybe by saying it's really nothing that's so big, and it's just central to the human condition, maybe after that particular regime ends, the informer is just demystified. Mm. It's just a, a, just a person, an ordinary person. And perhaps that might defuse, to some extent, the politicization of, of the past. Maybe that'll spark more conversations mm -hmm. that are calm and productive, mm -hmm. as opposed to full of invective. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think in the Czech context the informers are necessarily seen in as um, heated a sense as they might be in the Northern Irish context, although certainly some are. 
And I guess at the end of the day, what we wonder about is whether sometimes we would be better off taking and understanding informers, but making less hay out of them. Now, there's a downside to this, which is something we've avoided in our conversation so far. And, and I think, to some extent, our conversation falls into a trap that I think a lot of transitional justice, in particular legal interventions, fall into. And that is to talk all the time about the perpetrator, the harm doer, the harm inflictor. And clearly, harm inflictors fascinate us mm -hmm. because we're fascinated with the psychology of what, why people may hurt others. But doing nothing about the informer also leaves the people hurt by them without redress, conversational space, remedy, or attention. And there's something very lonely about that. And one thing we're very mindful of in our book is that by humanizing the informer, ironically, we may be dehumanizing the people who are informed upon. But another thing that we found, in fact, one of the most recent files that we've combed through the, the and these files are huge. I mean, there's like hundreds of pages in there with everything from love letters to photographs to uh, gossipy interviews to, it's uh, quite unbelievable. They're, they're really like a, a, a biography of the person. One of the most recent ones we went through was of an informer who was an engineer who worked for IBM in Prague. And almost all, he, he had a, a hundred or so meetings with secret police in which he provided information. But almost all of his file is full of information about him ginned up and generated by other informers. So this man was both informer and informed upon. He was both snitcher and snitched upon. So there's this tremendous duality. And, and at the end of the day, perhaps we can better recognize informing as social navigation if we deflate the conversation by being less judgmental about it but then there's the risk of, of the people hurt by informers being left out in the cold. And I don't know what to do about that. What do you think? Well, I'm gonna, I, that, that, I think this brings me to my final uh, comments or question, and it is about what you just raised, which is the role of uh, uh, victims in all of this discourse. And so um, the day that we're recording this is the day after the British government has uh, once again refused to hold a public inquiry into the death of Pat Finucane, a human rights lawyer um, who was murdered um, by agents of the state. He was murdered by informers. The weapons were provided by other informers. The intelligence which set him up was provided by informers. And the police were actively involved as collusive agents and probably other elements of the state as well. And, and his, the victims in this context, his family, have been campaigning for 30 years um, to, to have this public inquiry. And, and there are, there are, it speaks to a bigger issue, I think, around all of this. So on the one hand, for those of us who, I, I, I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm firmly in this camp, who are um, victim-centered around this and, and, and focus on victims' right to truth in particular, um, I would say that that, that, that that case and other cases like it, um, that the ugliness of what happened needs to be exposed for the health of our democracy. But I've, I have met other colleagues who I respect, um, former officials and others who will say, on all of this, it's too, the war was too dirty. It was such an ugly, dirty war. We're better letting sleeping dogs lie. Wh where do you sit in that debate? I think we also have to be realistic about something. In communist Czechoslovakia, the vast majority of people who were informed upon were not harmed or hurt and, or murdered. There was a repressive part of um, Czechoslovakian history, mostly in the 1950s. But after that, the effects of being informed upon were much more, um, you didn't get promoted at work, you got reassigned to some crummy job, um, you may have lost some privileges, your kid may not have gotten into university. And these are all cruelties. But I don't think we're talking uh, about the same level of, of tragedy that, that you evoke. And I think it's very important when talking about informing, as with all human rights abuses, to not let the most extreme cases uh, 
that are several standard deviations away from the mainstream cases define the harms of that particular act. I also think there's another very interesting dynamic that we see emerging by our review of the files, which is the agency of the secret agents themselves, the secret police, with what they do with the information that they receive. And what we find in the files is they're, they're chock full of so much information that the secret police agent never did anything about. He, most of them were he's, he listened, jotted it all down, filled the file, and put it away. And the information about someone else who may have done something wrong disappeared, only to be appearing again when check clarity laws permitted the opening of the files for everyone to read that particular stuff. So I guess one answer to the question that you raised is the following quickly. Perhaps in situations where the informer provides information that leads to very brutal results, the appropriate blameworthy person there is not the informer per se, but the government's agents who committed that brutality. And that would also open up another key conversational space in authoritarianism or in systematic human rights abuses or, or in zones of occupation, which is the reality that occupiers, autocrats, and their agents and acolytes and minions also are human and also will act differently on different days with the power that they may have. They may sometimes deploy that power and sometimes not. And I'm not trying to romanticize a low-level secret police agent, but what we're finding is they did nothing with a lot of the info that they got, and, and why is that? Why is that? Is it because they liked the person that was being informed on? Is it because they didn't feel like it? They didn't think it was worthwhile? I don't know. But that's also an interesting subject. The exercise of bureaucratic conscience, yes. Or yeah. laziness, who knows? Yeah. But we don't know much about that. And that's another angle we would like to open up discursively in the book. Mark, this is, this is rich and fascinating stuff. I suspect that the Finucan family would agree with you on the I think their emphasis is definitely on the people who pulled the strings rather than the people who pulled the trigger. Um, but anyway, I think we have run out of time. Mark, this is a fascinating topic. I shall look forward to that book coming out. It's always a treat um, reading any of your work, and I'm really looking forward to it. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.